um, welcome. Um, I want to do a video on an essay by a philosopher called John Gray, British philosopher. Um, also, before we get started, the reason I look like I'm going snowboarding is because the heating in my flat is broken. So, um, it's pretty cold, so I'm sitting here in the cold, so it's not a fashion statement. Anyway, um, the essay we're talking about in particular here is called Hyperliberalism. I'll leave a link to it in the description, but it's behind a kind of paywall or a kind of subscription wall, so it's I, I couldn't actually get the actual essay and, like, you know, a uh, quote from it. But I, I read it a while ago, and I remember... Um, I remember the basic argument, um, um, and I think it's it's a good thing to go over in this idea. As you can see, there is no debate on free speech, is what I put in the title, and put in that title, not because I'm making a, a, a position or a claim on um, free speech, whether it's good or bad. I mean, I'm generally for it, but um, the the debate which we see popular at the moment is between two factions. One is kind of classically liberal, and this comes from Mills. This comes from John Stuart Millsian view of uh, the utility of speech. This is where we get our free speech um, um, ideas from, or values from, um, versus the kind of, you know, as you're, the more sensorial cancel culture style kind of um, progressive liberal view which is much more sensorial and so on um i think that there's there's this there's there's a misunderstanding a lot of people have that these are in contention with each other or principled ideologies which are opposing each other and this essay by john gray is useful because he he he, he criticizes mills john stuart mills um in a way which shows you this the the hyper liberal or the kind of woke sensorial liberal side is it's kind of just an extension of the classical liberal side um they do differ in some ways but this isn't like a genuine principle ideological split um so let's go over this a bit so basically hyper -liberal liberalism john gray argues that um, if you look at the passage from Mills where he talks about free speech, and the quote is here, I'm not going to read the whole thing out, but you can read it there yourself. But the basic argument is a kind of utilitarian value of free speech. So, for example, um, you allow bad opinions to be contrasted to the good opinions um, in order to basically um, uh, allow the good opinions to stand out um now there's nothing wrong with this argument in itself it's it's better to have a it's better for false for, it's better for bad ideas maybe to be aired so that we can so, we, so that we can see that they're you know in a sense false or bad or based on faulty premises and so on and so forth but it, there's more to the story than that and you can see you see in this quote that um there's a kind of generational motif which goes through it um so he says the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it is robbing the human race posterity as well as the existing generation um those who descend from the opinion still more than those who hold it is basically th there's an implicit idea here that um open debate free speech has a kind of linearity to it it kind of has a historical linearity to it so there so as great points out there's a sort of idealism here which isn't supposed to be in a utilitarian thinker utilitarian, utilitarian thinkers aren't supposed to think in terms of historical um ideals but there's a kind of progressive historical ideal here which which states that if bad opinions are um like I suppose, but you, okay, let's put it this way. There's a faith inserted into this argument that by way of free speech, a truly rational, enlightened society can be reached and perhaps a truly rational, enlightened subject can be formed. Um, 
so it isn't just about the utility of speech merely for the sake of what for the sake of finding out what is true in a kind of in a kind of bare minimal scientific sense um there's a sort of a underlying um trajectory of history we could say or of, at least of in kind of intergenerational accumulation of truth or facts um for the sake of a truly rational state and perhaps a truly rational subject to go along with that state so there's a so, so we, we could put it this way like modernity is 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 the implicit direction of this of this of this utilitarian argument it, it's not separable from that view of history and view of modernity and a view of a kind of rational becoming of a human subject um so but john gray basically points out this this let's flip over to today and you have the hyper liberal so you have the you have the what we would refer more um commonly as like woke or maybe maybe progressive woke liberal um and we're encountering all this all of the issues with censorship and with cancel culture and we suddenly we we suddenly landed ourselves in a much more sensorial and a much more punitive and a much less open in terms of speech um society and we're kind of wondering how we got here and john gray basically says that if you look at the hyper liberal what it's obsessed with is something called atavism and atavism is basically a term taken from biology which means the reoccurrence of traits of previous generations so let's take a complete like evolutionary biological example um let's say someone was born with a slight tail or something you're born with a tail it's like how did that happen well that's a that's an evolutionary trait which we used to have when we were in a um when we were in like when we were monkeys and um that trait re kind of just by happen chance kind of reasserted itself into the uh biology of a person and that's like an atavistic trait so um so the way in which the hyper liberal responds to opinions which it sees as offensive or dangerous and so on um is basically that of atavism so you have kind of an atavistic reoccurrence of uh, ideas which we've told ourselves that we've evolved out of um so for example have you, you've probably many of you have probably had a, had a discussion with somebody and they say how can you think that it's let's take an example being something like gender roles as in a popular kind of um discussion point today it's like um if you say no i think there are some legitimate gender roles which are kind of um not just historically contingent things but they're kind of eternal and just a part of human nature for example um um you're gonna normally get a response which is at least by someone on the progressive side which is that how how can you say this it's 2022 right 20 yeah, i was like what year is it 2022 um so there's a kind of um uh justification for something merely on the merit of what year it is which is a strange which is a strange idea it's a deeply historic historical idea it's a deeply um kind of a uh, extreme historicism we could say um so how is this related to classical liberal well it's the same thing right these traits in uh, these opinions or these beliefs which we may have tolerated say in a, in a classical liberal time period um we tolerated them because we had faith that they would be kind of rationalized away or that we would they, they would be overcome um and 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 kind of beaten out of this an anal analogized um marketplace of ideas and then what happens in the hyper liberal is that we see that when that doesn't happen that there are certain things that can't be rationally evolved out of um you don't know the atavistic is policed rather than tolerated so i wrote here like classical liberum equals the toleration of the atavistic for the sake of progressive awakening or kind of a linear rationality and the hyperliberal is policing 
the Atavistic. Um, so, uh, rather than saying, for example, um, we had classical liberal ideology, and then all of a sudden came all came along woke hyper liberal ideology and contested it, challenged it. Rather, what happened was something much more historically contingent, which was that we had a faith and a belief in this right in this kind of this. Um, it's, it's kind of it's, the end of history is a theme here too. Um, in this uh, idealized state of pure rationality, um, pure positivistic, we could say, scientific fact, without any ambiguities, without any gray areas, without any. Um, uh, um, beliefs which are held for the sake, you know, on, on a first principle basis for the sake of themselves and can't be logically deduced. Everything is very um, clear and rational. And when this doesn't happen, what happens to that faith in that, in, in that po historical point? Well, inst instead of having this kind of liberal faith and openness and toleration, all of a sudden the atavistic reminds us or the opinions which aren't acceptable um reminds us of a a, a doubt in that faith that this idea this kind of historically idealized state is non-existence and perhaps will never exist and when you get to that point um you suddenly have to treat bad thinking wrong thinking in a in a completely different manner you can no longer be open and tolerant to it um, because you don't have that faith anymore at least it's not confident we're not confident in the in the end point of a rational a, a completely rational truthful state because well it, it hasn't occurred we're, we're 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 still waiting for it right we're, we're waiting for the end of history to happen and we're always waiting for the end of history to happen we could put it that way um and um so then all of a sudden that's the change it's not so much a change in a different ideology it's actually a change in what happened to our faith in this rational point this um in this historical so emerging of this rational historical subject this rational historical state then we have to start policing those things which remind us of that insecurity or remind us of the non-existence or the the impossible to actually impossibility to actualize this state um so i put them i kind of made like it's not really a meme but like it's kind of like a, a joke kind of conversation between boomers who tend to be more on the classical liberal side and like millennials or generation more generation z really or maybe i don't know millennials whatever um it, you know the conversation could be something like this you know the boomer says good speech beats out the bad and then the the, the millennial or the gen z person says we know you just didn't beat it out hard enough so that so, so you see what i mean there's a the, the change is not principle of ideology the change is a kind of manner and a kind of emotive disposition towards wrong ideas going from we have we going for going from we're confident that the uh that the rational will overcome and then all of a sudden you're in this world and we're like oh, we're not so confident about that anymore um so just beat the crap out of anything that's that's you know so that that, that reminds us of this um uncertainty of this idealized rational state and then you have um this despotic element to, to liberalism comes not because of intrusive ideology, but because that faith is be as, as, as is now uncertain, and that trajectory is uncertain. So you have to um, you have to uh, do something more intrusive, invasive, aggressive, and so on. Um, so you see, I wrote when the market of ideas doesn't work, cancellation of the atavistic expression of atavistic expression requires more direct means the dispute is not about the means sorry the dispute is about the means and not about the ends the ends for both of these ideologies is basically the same it is this kind of and again john gray is um he argues against liberal universalism this is his main beef this is what he doesn't like it's it's the idea of um this absolute worldwide historical becoming of rational subjectivity and we could say alongside that 
a kind of a free market liberal democracy. Um, the this liberal universalism is, is the end in both of these hyper liberal and classically liberal ideologies. It's they just dispute over the means. One still kind of has a more tolerant view, but it still has faith in that point. It still believes, and we're getting to that point where the other goes, "No, um, we're not so sure about that point." But like we're not so sure about uh, getting to that point through kind of liberal tolerant um, means. We're going to have to do something more intrusive and harsher. So it's the means which are being disputed and not the end. And that's the important thing. Um, yeah, okay, that's it for today. But um, yeah, subscribe if, if you like this kind of stuff. All right, see you.